So let's talk about, we've talked about supports and using supports as an alternative to a legal process. So continuum of supports, if we can get back to the PowerPoint. Thank you. So this notion of least restrictive to most restrictive that shows up in this slide, that also, by the way, appears in the uh, rules of superintendence, the, the guardianship rule that the Supreme Court promulgated, which is based on work I and other people did at the Supreme Court on a, on a, on a subcommittee that designed standards for guardianships. And these rules are based on those standards. So Ohio is a best interest state. That means you have to look objectively at what is the best interest for the person. Many other states are, um, are, use a subjective test. Um, but Ohio has always been a best interest, interest state. Uh, for many reasons, the legislature has not wanted to change that standard. Uh, but now with this definition, you're, you're starting to get into some of those other considerations as you consider what's in the best interest. So it says, uh, means the course of action that maximizes what is best for the ward, including consideration of the least intrusive, most normalizing, and least restrictive course of action possible given the needs of the ward. So you see this notion of least restrictive alternative, uh, which has been around in the field for a long time, now formally codified in the guardianship rules at the Supreme Court. Um, next slide. So I'm not going to read this list. Um, these are the kind of daily decisions that people have to make. And that, again, looking at the stoplight, there's a lot of things that overlap. And starting with the least intrusive, informal support, assistance, circle of friends, peer groups, planning teams, supported decision making, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. It's a fairly new concept, um, although it's kind of just common sense too. Release of information, so if you get, uh, and this is sort of a checklist of things you can think about so that you don't have to go get guardianship. If the person can sign a release of information, if they can just say, articulate, I want mom and dad to have my med access to my medical records, then have them sign a release of information. Providers are great at trying to use HIPAA to protect themselves. They do it all the time. And so they will we'll call up and say, you know, we haven't, don't have a release yet, blah, 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 but I want to give you some information about my client. Oh, I can't listen, that's HIPAA. That's wrong. They can listen all day long, they just can't tell you anything. So people use HIPAA in odd ways and they don't understand it. I don't think there's much malice there, they're just worried about it. So if the person, if your loved one can give you a release of information, and this cuts across a lot of different systems. Say, I want mom and dad to have access to my information, that, that, that's huge. That makes, means they don't have to worry about liability, for violation of privacy laws, and they can give you information and they can engage in conversation with you. That's a huge one. Authorized representative is a formal uh, concept. It's in federal law for Medicaid and Social Security where you become that person's authorized representative. It's, a, it's like a payee. It's not, I'm sorry, it's like a release. It's like a power of attorney. It does both functions within that federal program. So you can be that person's advocate. You could speak for that person. When my daughter went on Medicaid, I don't think I'm telling any secrets here. You know, she's, she's young, she's got a baby, she's on Medicaid. Uh, she had a problem with eligibility, so she made me her authorized representative and I was able to call up and work through the problem and eventually represent her in a hearing as her authorized representative. And I had access to all of her records. So again, if the person's capable of saying that to you, and this is another, you know, let me just footnote a little bit, effective communication comes into play here. So if you called my office and said the county Medicaid office wouldn't take, wouldn't take my son's consent for me to be authorized representative because they said he has an intellectual disability. And the first question to them would be, what did he tell you? He said, I want my dad to be my authorized, I, I, I want my dad to, to have access to my, to my records. Um, and, but he can't read, so he can't sign the form. Well, guess what? Under the ADA and Section 504, they've got to accommodate him. And they have to accept that and note it in the file. And they know that. That's in their regulations, too. <coughs> but sometimes you have to remind them about that. So here again, accommodation, effective communication all come into play in terms of how these things work. So authorized representative protection orders. Uh, this is really important because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on my soapbox for like two minutes. So we have really good protective services laws in this state. The, they, they cover elders, children, 
and uh, people with IDD. So the county board has a function there. They're supposed to, if you, somebody files a complaint, and there are mandatory reporters to report abuse or neglect or exploitation. They are supposed to uh, conduct an investigation, and if the person needs protective services, they're supposed to offer it to the person, and if the person does not want it, so let's say somebody's in a really horrible abuse situation, but they don't want to leave, kind of like domestic abuse, that happens all the time, the, the person wants to stay with their abuser. They're supposed to go to the probate court, file for an involuntary protectorship, the court's supposed to hold a hearing and order the protection. There's one county in the state that does it on a regular basis, it's Lucas County. And most other states, most other counties don't have much going on there. Cuyahoga does some of it, Stark does some of it. But it's an area where, again, being neglected or abused is not incompetence. And there's a whole other structure there. And the Ohio Supreme Court's even recognized that. It says the county board's of DD's role is not to become a guardian or intervene in a guardianship, but it's to become, it's to file the protective services proceeding. So this is well-established law in both statute and case law, and yet it's not being done. So I'm back off my soapbox. Just think about it. If you have a problem with that, call my office, because we'd like to do more with that. Um, you should all have a trifold, by the way, that has the information on the office. Um, if, if you didn't get it, make sure you pick one up. So protective orders are an important part of us. And, and, and I'll go back to the uniform laws. The whole, the whole notion of guardianship is one part of a protective services scheme that some, most states have something like that. They have a whole scheme of protective services. Guardianship is the most extreme. Protective services is next, and then you know authorized representatives and other things, conservators, lots of state call it different things, but it should be part of a continuum, and unfortunately for lots of reasons, in Ohio we don't do that very well. Uh, powers of attorney, that's a formal legal instrument that uh, many of you, I hope you all have health care powers of attorney and living wills, and if you don't, go to the State Bar Association's website, get them down. You can do them without a lawyer, sign them, make sure you've got a loved one who can make your decisions for you if you get hit by a bus. God forbid that we all get hit by a bus. But if it happens, you really want that power of attorney in place. But that's a tool that your loved one with IDD can use to uh, designate you as someone who can make medical decisions, really any kind of decision, but medical decisions for them uh, without a guardianship. And that has to be honored by the care providers. And it's cheap. And it's free. So go to the OSBA website and look for it. Conservatorship is for somebody with a physical disability who wants someone to help them in a guardian-like manner, usually to manage estates. Um, very rarely used, but it's possible. And you can make an argument that a person with like cerebral palsy, for example, could use a conservatorship and avoid a finding of incompetency. And that's the value of a conservatorship. Limited guardianship, I talked a little bit about. You can limit the guardianship by time, date. Not the, you know, I want a guardian for one year. Or by the scope of the powers of the guardian. So within the guardian of the person, um, which is the person who makes medical decisions and where the person's going to live and whether they eat macaroni and cheese for lunch and that kind of stuff, uh, you can say, I only want it to be medical or I only want it to be with regard to a residential service provider or something like that, depending on the needs of the person. And what happens is because you've limited the power of the guardian, the, the person with the disability retains all rights that are not touched on by the powers of the guardian. So it actually works really well because that person still makes decisions in areas where they're capable to make decisions. And in the more complex areas or the areas that they feel they need help in, they have a limited guardian who can help them with that. And then full guardianship of the person, which is, means you make all decisions for that person. And, you, and you, it's not just you can make all decisions, it's that you're going to have to make all decisions. So all the care providers, everyone is going to turn to you and say, you need to sign a piece of paper as the guardian so that we can go forward with whatever we're going to do. Same with financial. There's a whole other list there, a couple of variations. Uh, most of the folks we're talking about don't have estates, so we don't see guardian of the state very much. That's even more complex than guardian of the person because you have to post a bond and you have to do accountings and it, it's a lot of work and it's, it's, it's uh, for, for people with small amounts of money, the court can 
waive the need for a guardian of the estate and, and put an order on that allows the guardian of the person to manage some of those things. But in terms of the financial, uh, you know, we've got a lot of options now. Um, you can have joint accounts. I think a lot of people use joint accounts um, and, and also, su again, supported decision making. We'll come back to trusts are interesting in this area because if you have a good lawyer who can help you put a trust together and now we have special needs trusts that help people qual stay qualified for Medicaid and we have stable accounts which also allow people to save some money and you don't need a guardian to do that. You, it lets people control their, their assets without having a guardianship and court oversight. Now, to be fair, I'll give you the other side. Um, probate judges and, and the probate bar hates powers of attorneys and it hates trusts other than that they get to draft the trust and make money, um, which they gotta make a living, I get it, um, because they're not overseen in the same fashion as a guardianship. And they're worried powers of attorney in particular, there's lots of abuse. Uh, or they think there's lots of abuse. And again, going back to the seniors, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau just put out rules about powers of attorneys for seniors and, and how that, those need to be regulated. So uh, elder abuse is a huge problem. Uh, financial abuse of elders is a huge problem. Exploitation. Um, does Mike, Mike DeWine, the Attorney General, his office does really good work in that area. Um, some legal services do good work in that area. They, well, one of the things they're requiring now is banks to be more attentive to fund transfers and things like that and to report them directly to the uh, protective services units so that they don't have, that, that it's, it's harder to steal money from uh, elders. Uh, and I'm sure we've all heard the stories. Um, so that's, that's another problem. And again, then you can go to full guardianship of the estate, but it's quite clumsy. And again, most people with IDD don't have estates large enough to justify that. Uh, next. 